This talk started because where I work, which I'll talk about in a sec, the people I work with are some very, very smart people who never want to come and do this. And so I'm talking to these guys about what sort of information they should be sharing and what they would like audience to understand. And one of the guys who leads the vulnerability team or part of the vulnerability team said, we should talk about these things. And that's where this talk has come from. Okay, so uh, cool. This is me. I work for IBM. I've been doing it for a long time, working for IBM, I mean. Uh, I started doing Java when it was 0.9 something. I was very lucky to get involved in the Java team. And I've done that pretty much continuously since Java came out. Uh, it's really scary to find that I'm working with people who were like three when Java started or old or younger. I did a couple of years, three years, where I ran a DevOps team, large DevOps team in the UK, and that's informed this, this talk because I've learnt both sides of the equation, both the Java developer's point of view about security and the ops guys, okay? And so that comes out in this talk. So this talk is about Java vulnerabilities, and can you guys hear me at the back? Can you, are you okay? You can hear me? Good. Uh, can I, well, I thought there'd be a, I've got this. Okay, I'll try and shout louder. If you don't, if, if you, if I make, if I get excited and you stop understanding me, just wave your hands. Okay, okay. So, this talk is about Java vulnerabilities. It's about how the industry manages vulnerabilities, okay, and what are things like attack vectors. Boring things you need to understand. It's about the scary side of this, why this is important. And of course, it's got code in it. Not a great deal of code, not the most sophisticated code, but it's got some in there to help you understand, okay? So let's start with, what is a vulnerability? We talk about Java vulnerabilities, and it's all over the place, and, and it's just a word, vulnerability. This is a Java vulnerability. Uh, I don't know if you can, you can probably see the little circle. This is a diff, it's a git diff, and you can just see it's got a plus one there. Okay, can you see that? Because this is going to be fun if you can't. Um, this fixed <coughs> a really big problem, okay? But it didn't start off as being a really big problem. So it fixes a bug in pars double. So you've probably used this at some point. You've probably done double dot pars and got some string, okay? The interesting thing is, if you gave it, okay, you, can, anybody, can you just see that red? You probably can't see the red. Can we drop the light or is that impossible? Okay, <laughs> it's probably gonna be too late. Don't worry about it, because it's only bits of red. Um, so there's a number, 2.250, blah, 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 blah. Very, very specific number. And what would happen is there was a bug in the pars double, and if it was given just that number, the parser, the thing that was turning the string into a real double, would go into an infinite loop. Did that get better or worse? Um, and it got reported in 2001, sat around for 10 years, and, nobody and people went, so? Who's ever going to put that number in a string? Okay. However, here's the downside. People suddenly realized where you put strings. Okay. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay, let me go back. So just so that you can see the number. Okay. Are oh, you going to see it again? I'm using my headset. There we go. There's the number, 2.25, okay? Right, so what happened? It's about parsing strings into doubles, okay? And it turns out, unfortunately, that every Java server and pretty much had this bug, okay? So what do you do? Well, you find a place where you can put a double in and you send it to the server and if you put the right number in, and when you send it to the server, the server hangs, okay? 
And so that's called a denial of service attack because you just keep doing it. You imagine if you've got a web server and you're serving up, you know, your Amazon or whoever you are, and I can make each, each of your servers hang, then eventually your system stops. That is a denial of service attack, okay? Right. And it was done because it turns out that the HTTP protocols that you've probably played with and seen and used have a float in them. The except, for instance, has got a parameter and it says the parameter will take something equals a float. Okay, so it looks like this. Okay, this is a common one. This, in fact, this except is used by all sorts of things because what this except does is it says to the server when it's getting out some audio, um, how fast? Okay, the quality, 0.2. So if you did this, If you have this bug in your server, your server goes into hanging mode because it's in a recursive loop forever. And there you go. Okay? And you just do it like this. Quick quick curl, and there you are. Bring down the server of your choice. Okay? So this is in the system for 10 years. And then 2011, somebody figured out how to do it. Uh, there is the URL if you want to go read about the details. But basically what happened was trivial to exploit. Anybody can do this. And there are all these people like yourselves and 15-year-old boys in their bedrooms or 10-year-old girls in their bedrooms, whatever it is. They're all got, they're going, this is easy. I can do this. Because remember, this is way before there's any security checking. This is, I'm going to make a call to a server and it's going to respond. Servers always, always respond. Okay? This brought down the internet, basically. If you had a Java server at the time when this came out, uh, there was a massive push to fix it because otherwise you were dead in the water. Okay? So the important thing to start off with is to understand this, that a vulnerability is a bug which can be exploited by an attacker. Somebody unfortunately wrote the code and they made a mistake. Somebody else un unfortunately found the mistake and then somebody else exploited it. Okay. So there's lots of ways that these exploits can happen. Okay. But if you think about what people try to do nowadays, they want to bring your system down. Sometimes it's for fun, sometimes it's for profit, as in, well, they may try and ransom you. If you don't pay us some money, we'll keep doing this. Uh, there may be somebody, you may have a competitor who is more uneth who's unethical and decides they're going to pay somebody to bring down to your website because then you go out of business. Okay, so those sorts of things. Um, reducing your integrity. Can I get into your system? Can I change your data? Can I steal your data? And the big one, the thing that everybody is looking for, is code execution. Can I find a way to get into your system to run arbitrary code? It's called RCE. It's the biggest thing of all because once I can get into your system to run some code, I can run any code. And that gives me the ability to wander around your system and, and do all sorts of things. Okay. And then the other last ones like breach confidentiality. Can I steal your data? Can I, can I get improved privileges? If I get improved privileges, like can I find root access, then you can imagine I can do more things. Okay. It's those sort of things. If you think about it, it's pretty straightforward what people will be looking to do, okay? And the interesting thing is, now they also want to steal your <coughs> CPU time. So how many of you have connected to a Wi-Fi and had a little pop-up come up where you type in some details and you say accept? Okay, everybody's done that, yes? Well, some of those have been hacked so that while you're sitting there waiting to make a decision, it's good running JavaScript. And while it's running JavaScript, it's doing Bitcoin mining. So people will be trying to get into your system not to steal your data, but to steal your CPU. If you have a Jenkins server, then maybe I can get in there and get something to run. And they're not going to try and run things to exhaust your system. They're going to try and steal a small amount of CPU so you never notice. Right? It's a big thing. 
so why should you care? How often do these bad things happen? Okay, so let's level set about what's actually going on. Cybercrime reality. So we switch into dark slides. Ooh. Okay, so the first thing is, do you think cyber criminals are lone hackers? Do you think that they're like the movies, it's some guy sitting in a corner, you know, the, hey, it's Unix, I can hack this, it's the one-offs, you know, you may go, I know somebody, he's a bit like that, he's a hacker, okay, well, yeah, these guys are around, but actually, organized crime is the thing that makes the most money. So this is people getting together, groups of people getting together, not individuals, getting together. Oh, thank you. That's nice. Oh, uh, so I start again? No. Um, so it's big guy. It's, the orga it's organized crime that is the biggest threat to us. So in 2016, okay, change how old the charts are, but 2016, cybercrime was estimated to be worth $450 billion. The drug trade, same year, 435. Now these are estimates because for some reason bad guys won't tell you how much money they make, <laughs> right? But people can guess and, they, and it's informed guesses, so it's quite good. So 2016 was the year where cybercrime became of, became of age and suddenly was as valuable as the drugs trade. So you think about all the movies you've seen where people stealing drugs, moving drugs, you know, all those, and it's, you know, burying money in the ground, all that. So all that excitement, that size, all those hero heroic escapes from prison you hear about, the drug, the cybercrime guys are making just as much money. We don't hear anything about it. So which one do you think of these two? being a selling drugs or hacking a system is going to be least risk. Which one is you which one are you more likely to go to the prison for? Any ideas? Selling drugs? Yeah. Yeah. Which of these two is growing the fast? The drug trade or the cybercrime? Cybercrime? Yeah. Okay. Which do you think is hardest to prosecute? C cybercrime. Yes, because though you can arrest somebody with drugs in their pocket, it's very hard to arrest somebody who's hacking your system when they're in some very far away country. It doesn't matter where they are. They're just so distant, it's impossible. Okay. Now, which of these two is going to reach $2 trillion? I want to say that in a voice. $2 trillion by next year. Yeah, and which one's going to reach $6 trillion? Cybercrime. So those numbers just don't mean anything. So I put them on a chart. So these, this chart is based around numbers that you can get on the web. Uh, there's lots of information and guesstimates. Okay, so these are sort of like trying to figure out which is the reasonable. But this is how it works. The red line is going to be cybercrime. The green line is drug trade. Watch. Whoa. The drug trade is... is for want of a better word, under control. The law enforcement know how it works and they know how to do it and there's sort of a boundedness of it, okay? Cybercrime has no bounds. Nobody is doing anything effective to stop it and it's just, just going through the roof. That number, that's about 600 euros per person on the planet. And for thus, those of us living in more affluent countries, like here, it's probably about 8,000 euros each. They're not stealing that from you directly, unless you're very unlucky. I do know people who have had hacks, attacks, that have got that money, amount of money off people. Normally what happens is, is that all the services that you buy, whether it's insurance or whether it's supermarkets, they all lose money one way or the other, and they, they put their prices up to, to cover the loss. And that comes down to you. So uh, your cost of living goes up dramatically because cybercrime is staking money everywhere. Okay? That's why it's important. That's why I do these talks. 
because we pay we pay as developers we pay little attention to this so it's important to understand that just because you don't see it happening doesn't mean it isn't happening right so let's go ooh, let's go back to code let's talk about vulnerabilities um this is not the greatest example but bear with me so i have a mac which you can tell by the path um and i have a directory and it's got a space in it which i'm allowed to do if i'm writing some java code and i want to refer to that i will put it in url and i'll put a percentage 20 in to replace the space i'll escape it we all know how to do that okay and i'll write some code around that so i have a url and i say create a file get the path of the url and i'm going to do two things i'm going to print out the full path and I'm going to print out a test to see whether the part the file exists. Okay, so I run that code, and the f it says there's the path of the URL. Okay, and does it exist? False. Well, because why not? Well, because I forgot to decode it, because it's still got percentage percentage twenty in. Oh, sorry, losing my head. Okay, so let's fix that. So I have a URL. And now I create a URI from the URL, S okay? So I can actually get the decoding, and then I can do the same thing, and I can say, get the path, and does it exist? So when I run it again, having made that one line change, I've now got the right path out, and the, it exists, good. So what's the big deal, okay? Well, what would happen if that file system, that, uh, that path that I referenced with the percentage 20 in, what happens if somebody had created that? Okay, it shouldn't exist, but I was trying to refer to it. My test, rather than failing, would have passed because the file really exists. Okay? Oops. Not a big deal? Okay. When you couple that sort of mistake with knowledge that on windows who here's a windows programmer runs on windows i should say yeah okay 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 let's just check who's linux and who's mac anybody else there we got a spark system yeah okay right so on windows by design you don't need specific any um, permissions to create a top level directory make directory c colon something okay Still not a big deal? Okay. What happens if it's tucked away in your, your Java configuration is a class path or an extensions directory? That's a quite good one. You know about extensions directories <coughs> where you can add code into the JVM and you can get it to run when you bring it up. Well, suppose you had something like this. C colon program, percentage 20 files, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That could be in your path. And even if it doesn't exist, you wouldn't notice because the system would look at it and go, I can't find the file, the path, I'll move on. Okay, lots of Java products, all sorts of Java products have clever things like that to allow them to, uh, they'll configure a base and then they'll have extensions. It's quite a common pattern, okay? But you wouldn't know that was there. Now, suppose the JVM had a bug in it and it didn't decode those URLs, okay? Suppose it made a mistake. And suppose somebody created that directory, because bearing in mind they can go right to the root, C colon program, percentage 20 files, okay? You wouldn't notice that. But suppose somebody could do that, they could get your application to load DLLs. They can get your code, your application to your JVM to run code, right? Just because you had a path that didn't exist, and somebody created it, right? All because of one URL, because of one line, right? That's not quite what happened, but actually a bug like that was in the JVM for years, okay? So the fact was the JVM wasn't doing the right decoding and somebody figured out that if they could create file paths like that, they could actually get your application to run things it wasn't supposed to do, okay? The interesting thing is, 
it's just another little bug, okay? Vulnerabilities are really simple, right? There's no big piece of code that says, this is a security vulnerability, fix it later. People make design, poor design choices. People code and make mistakes. That's what happens. What the bad guys do is they figure out what those are and they join them together. So I made, so this was a combination of two weaknesses. There was a weakness in the way that Windows is designed. There was a weakness in, in a, there was a bug in the JVM. They're brought together and suddenly found, or somebody found a way to execute code that uh, get you to execute code that you weren't expecting. Okay. So I say all this and people go, developers go, huh? Why do I care? Okay. Well, let's think about you. So let's nip back to the bad guys. Who do the bad guys go after? Well, there's a series of classic patterns that you can see. So uh, they'll go after the, they'll be looking. So I should say, when I say go after, I mean, they'll go and track you. How many of, here, how many of you here use Twitter? Yeah, how about Facebook? Wow, oh, is, that, is that Facebook? Um, however you do it, <coughs> the chances are that some of you will be sharing information about how you get on with your colleagues at work, okay? And so anybody who puts on Facebook that um, they don't like their boss, they're afraid of their boss, is a great target, okay? Because I can get, if you're frightened of your boss, maybe I can make you do something if I make you think I'm your boss. <coughs> okay. What about new pe people who join? Right as soon as they got into the, they've got straight into your business, they're brand new, they get an email saying, can you do this? And it's from HR. And they go, okay then, I'll do that. Right. So they'll be targeting that. If you say on Facebook, hey, I've just joined this new company, you might find you get an email saying from the HR people because of those. Okay, not from the HR. Okay, and people are really busy who will get, who will ignore the signs in the spam and the scams, right? And then of course there's the people who don't like the company they work for, and if somebody paid them to leak secrets, they'd be happy to do so. Okay, and then there's us developers. People like us. Okay, bad guys prey on the weak, the vulnerable, and the ignorant. Okay. People like developers because, well, you know how the code's written, right? Because you write the code. Well, you know how ins you know how systems work internally. Okay, you tend to have extra privileges. You know, you run things in root. You are very trusting. How many here have downloaded code from the internet? Okay. How many of you have um, checked the license of the code that you've downloaded from internet? Okay, how many of you checked the providence of the code? Have you gone to see what the website of the guy who produced the code looks like? Do you have a sense that the person producing this is trustworthy? And he, there's a way, look, half a wavy hand, okay? Okay, so some of you have checked the license or, okay. How many of you checked the license of the dependencies of the dependencies of the dependencies that you've downloaded? <laughs> yeah, right, we do Maven, update the POM, Maybe it install, stuff comes down, okay? And if we have some policy, we might check the top level thing we're gonna use. My company says that license is okay, but we tend to stop there, okay? So we tend to do that. And we like people's tools. We like people's tools, we like people's instructions. Uh, there's some really classic examples of Stack Overflow where there are, people have put very bad advice. Write code like this, it'll be great. And it is literally somebody trying to scam you right and we go fine thank you very much we read stuff on the internet we follow it because we think the people who are writing it are completely trustworthy okay and we are quite ignorant of security the nearest we talk about security is encryption which is not security at all okay so the bad guys prey on the weak the vulnerable and the ignorant and i say that is us and that was definitely me and it may be you, okay? Now, if you don't agree, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever done any of this? Ever Googled for getting Java to accept all the certificates over HTTPS? 
Googled for a very trusting trust manager, if you know what I'm talking about. How I do, how do I disable certificate validation in Java? You know that one? Maybe it's not Java, but maybe you just be looking for how to turn off checking because there's some self-signed certificate. How do I turn it off? Okay. How many of you have ever written one of these? Can you see what that is? Trust manager. Okay. New trust manager. And the two important things are in red. The is the client trusted? Yes. Is the server trusted? Yes. You Google for this, you get this piece of code and you copy it and you stick it in your systems because it's easy. Right? We do this all the time. Okay? All the time. The whole world does it. How bad can it be? Well, so I did this GitHub search. Implements Trust Manager. You can do that on GitHub, you can go in, okay? So here's 103,000. I think I did this check this recently. I think it'd gone up. Look at some of the nice words you see. All trusting security manager plugin. A very trusting trust manager that accepts anything. Um, a very friendly accepting trust manager factory allows anything through. Always valid trust manager. So you go, oh, this is funny. But you know all those dependencies that you downloaded and the, their dependencies and their dependencies, some of this stuff is in real code that people put up on the internet for people like you to make use of. And it's not necessarily done maliciously, but it's just easy. Okay? It's called a feature. You'll look and somebody will say, my system has a feature for, me, for you to disable security checking. And you go, oh, that's just what I'm looking for. Okay. So to this, okay, uh, a vulnerability is a bug. We can add a vulnerability is also a feature. Okay. So you guys design things thinking about the happy things that you can do with it. And you don't think about the bad things that can happen to it if it is misused. And it is misused very quickly nowadays the number at the time the number of people involved in finding exploits in your code is rising both on the bad guy's side and <laughs> the on the good guy's side because there are so many of them and we'll talk about how you can look for these right but everybody's looking for this you, there's no escape right when we started um I don't know, t beginning at the beginning of the, the millennium, 2002, 2003, the time it took for somebody to find a vulnerability was pretty long, and then the time to fix it was quite long, and the time to exploit was enormous. It took, there was no bad guys out there, comparatively. But now, you've seen what's happened, so we're all trying to find these things and get them fixed so that you aren't, you aren't compromised. So let's talk about the boring bit. Let's talk about how we manage this stuff. Right. So uh, vulnerabilities, well, they're, they're actually called Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, CVEs. And you may have heard about CVEs if you didn't know what it was. Um, it's, it's under this international group right? It's not a Java thing, it's a software thing. Everybody, all the software products have agreed to register all their vulnerabilities and there's basically one or two places you can go, but they're called CVEs, okay? You can go to cve.mitre and go have a look, okay? So the, the least it gives you is the understanding that a problem that we're talking about has got a name that you can go search for and it's a greed name, because if there's a vulnerability, sometimes these vulnerabilities are not their design problems. And sometimes those design problems occur in more than one set of software. So you end up with talking about, have you got this particular thing fixed? So we talk about a particular CVE. Okay. You can go to this website and you can search. So you can go to MITRE and you can say keywords. I did, one of these is Java. I think that's Java. One of them is Java serialization, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the point is not that you can find anything, 
The point is that everything has vulnerabilities. Because you've seen it's all about people making mistakes in the way that they code and they get exploited. That's never going to go away. You're never going to find a product that has no entries unless nobody's ever going to use it again. Right? And you see, you look at the details. Oh, this is the serialization one. But you see the words. Okay, they're not enormous. Look, here's one closer up. Okay. Unspecified vulnerability, some version numbers. Uh, what it can basically do, maybe give you a hint. Okay. If you go to the website and look at this, this is all you're going to read. Okay. There is a really good reason why we're not going to tell you any more than that. And here is my analogy. If, okay. If we talk about the code differences that make up the vulnerability, if we explain how it works, then we've just given the keys to the bad guys. And that is the same as me credit, um, tweeting my credit card number and PIN. Right? You wouldn't do that. I'm not doing that. So, so we're not going to give you information. Right? So you just have to trust that the people who have to fix it know what the problem are, is. But uh, general public, we're going to try and hide that from you. That's not to say you can't go reverse engineering it from the open source if you work really hard, but we're not going to make your life easy. Okay. So how do you know that one of these things is important? If you can't see the code, well, we have a scoring system. Yeah, lots of words, um, I, okay, because it's complicated. But basically, we assess. Let me give you a better one. Okay, uh, we have this thing called a vector. And we work out based on various aspects. So there's all sorts of things. Um, how do what the attack vector is? How do they get into your system? Uh, how complicated is it to achieve penetration? How do I have to do lots of hard things? Is it easy to get in? Right? Um, confidential impact. Is it like to give away sensitive data? All this stuff. It's assessed. It's given a score. Okay. And basically, there are some numbers. If you get high scores, if CVEs come out with high scores, you fix them because it's, it's a pretty bad problem. Low scores, more up for you to make sense of, make decisions around. The problem is, all of this is done by the assumption that you guys are acting sensibly. And if you've got a server and everybody has root access, or um, you use basic authentication, or all those sorts of things, all bets are off because you're not doing the basic level of security that's the sh that they assume you're going to do. Okay. So we'll tell you these things in multiple ways. The two obvious companies you, from a Java point of view, are going to be Oracle and IBM. We both have ways of sharing, and it depends which JVM you're using as to how you get the data. Okay. Um, that's, we just put it out on newsletters. Okay. Now, if you discover one, or you think it's one, we'd like you to report it sensibly. Okay, we really don't want you to be tweeting about it or even saying on Facebook, hey, I found a vulnerability in Java. So no, don't do that. Okay. Um, the simple answer is in general, report it to the product where you think you've got it. I mean, even if you're not sure, you just go, I think this may be a vulnerability. Okay. Um, just don't share it. Right. And don't worry too much about the severity. Let the other guys figure out the impact. If you think you can see a way round something that you think wasn't part of this design, it's good to report. Okay. Now, having got this stuff coming in from all these various places, how do we fix it? Well, we have development teams and we have so many people. So we have to prioritize. So we will fix it as soon as possible based on the impact. But we only have so many human beings, so not everything gets fixed. But the important bit is if, so that means that if you get any sort of out of bound uh, statement from any product anywhere, not just Java, that says w we have a regular s cycle for updates, here's one that's not in that cycle, that means it's seriously important and you should be applying it as soon as possible. And then it's like, 
So I've been told about this thing. How do I know whether I should apply it? I don't know what the code is. Well, it'll tell me what componentry it'll be applied to. This is a Java serialization problem. This is a JAXP problem. This is a JAXB. This is a Tomcat problem, whatever. All right. So the first thing you're going to say is, do I care? Do I use that thing? Okay. Okay. And then you look at all this other information, which in practice basically is not what you're going to do. And basically, you're going to get an update and you're going to apply it. Okay. And if you're going to make decisions about not applying that update, you're now going to start looking at dependencies in that s that's mentioned and go, do I use that? Okay. The problem is, if you don't know what your code does, you don't know it's vulnerable. Well, we've assessed that. That's just bugs. If you don't know what your dependencies do, you don't know if you're vulnerable. You don't know what your dependencies are. We've just assessed. All right. And the problem is, this is you. This is all your dependencies. That's your application. That's the bit of code you write. This is all the code you use. Okay. There's all sorts of stats flying around, but let's say for every few hundred lines of code that you write, there's probably half a million lines of code in the dependencies you use. Okay. Now, if you're writing very, very large products, that balance will change. But in general, the whole point is your work, you are building your software on top of a stack of other software. So your code is always outnumbered. So it's always, the fact is, is that you have all these dependencies and they all have vulnerabilities in. Right, okay. Attack vectors. Um, this is a fancy word for how do they get into your system? Um, there's all sorts of ways. Um, untrusted data is the big one which is you let, th you let them in. You get data into the system, you don't validate it. Okay, so I'll talk about one or two. Um, you can, re I mean, these slides will go up online, you can read them, so I'm not gonna call out everything, but one that you'll really like is you tend to think as data coming in as being text or binaries or it's a JSON file or something, okay? But it's a bit more than that because it's also things like images, Okay. It turns out that there was this particular version of C code. Oh yeah, bear in mind that Java is written on, is runs on JVM that's written in C code and there's lots of native libraries that are written in C code. Turned out in a particular version of a, a JPEG parser there was a little bug. And that meant that some bad guy could take that pretty picture of a pretty picture of a kitten and could craft a delivery payload so that it would, when uploaded onto your system, would call a buffer overflow, which basically triggers, makes the C code overflow its boundaries and triggers execution of code. So tucked away in the back of this piece of the kitten was some nasty little payload, okay? Just a bug, but it was in the data that was coming up from your system, that was being uploaded to your system, not just in JSON files or forms data and stuff like that. Okay, uh, there are other ways. So this GORP is, uh, I think, at the bottom. This is Apache Struts, and on the top of it is GORP content type. So it's a header, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so this wonderful little thing uh, caused some excitement because what happened here was this content type comes in you know about this you get some you get some t um, content type in from the client on the browser or another server and what Apache struts does is it says does this content type have multi-part form data in it and it says yes so it goes thank you very much I've now had valid data so its validation was basically going, does it contain that portion of a string? That valid data, which was actually, as you can see, invalid, uh, the, the next part of Apache Struts tried to parse it. That fails, as you'd expect. And as part of the failure, Apache Struts has some code, and as part of the failure, this, as 
part of the failing case, a piece of code, I spotted that this thing was called OGNL, which is a uh, scripting language for Apache struts. And because it saw that, it thought it would be helpful and it executed the code. So it's not even, a, it's not even as part of the mainstream, it was actually an error path. Okay, and as you can see here, it's got things like Java Lang runtime, get runtime, exec. Okay, you can put whatever you want in there. Okay, this is content type, so this is pre security checks. Okay, let's just call this. Anybody heard of Equifax? I guess I do this talk and other talks, and occasionally there'll be some poor guy from Equifax there. All right, and everybody goes, and he's going, look, it's been years, yeah. But what happened here was an example where uh, the developer was being helpful and executed and ended up causing something to happen that wasn't intended and uh, executed code. But also, the other part problem here was that there was no prop, there was no, the error, the data checking coming in was not <laughs> sufficient. They just said, did it have the right part of the right string? That's cool. That was poor. Okay. So all that trusted code thing, untrusted code thing, is a big attack vector. Again, more goal, more words, but you can guess what it is. If you do not read when data comes into your system, if you don't validate it correctly, then you are very vulnerable. And the majority of us do not validate our data properly because we don't think about bad things that can happen. So what else we got? Uh, plug in and web start. Anybody use those anymore? Good. Let's move on. Um, yeah, loads of those. Three hundred. Yeah, keep going. Um, there are vectors, attack vectors in cryptographic stuff. So this is nasty. This is when somebody finds a vulnerability in the encryption software you use. And there's basically two types of this. There's when occasionally somebody finds a protocol problem. The design is broken. And they get nice names like Beast and Poodle. Or occasionally somebody finds a bug in the implementation, in which case they just get a high severity CVE and people get hit over the head to apply it quickly. But even here, even in the bedrock of things that you rely on, there are still possibilities of vulnerabilities. Okay. And then people can get into your system, local tax. And people go, no, nobody can get to my system. But if I can get into your system, uh, well, I have full access to your system. And if you're a developer and you've got root access and you can do and you get into a server, if I can get it into the box as a real user, I can do pretty much what I want, okay? Because if I can get into your system, then I can leave code behind to let me get into your system another way and later on. Okay, you can imagine it's a pretty bad thing to happen and for some reason, from a CVS point of view, they don't consider access to the system to be that common, so they tend not to score these things very high. Okay. Do you think you're vulnerable to local attacks? Mm, well. Anybody know what this is? Anybody been hit by this? Did I hear the word? Well, yeah, wanna cry, wanna cry. So, wanna cry is a really good example of the really dark side of the net. So much of what you can get in terms of uh, the tools that the cybercrime guys use, many, many of them are public. Right? They're not on the dark side, but you can go to the dark side of the, of the web and you can buy payload delivery engines and WannaCry used one of those. What WannaCry did was get into your system and encrypt you, encrypt your data, and then try and ransom you. Okay? You can go read about it. It's horrible because it brought down these things. You can see maybe the inks. Like in India, it brought all the ATMs down. Okay? Apparently, Renault halted some production. <coughs> Nissan halted all production. Okay. The UK's NHS got impacted because you couldn't get into your system, so you couldn't see patient data. Okay. 12th of May 2017 infected 250,000 computers in 150 countries. Okay. And what the Bitcoin guys said 
if the Bitcoin guy, sorry, the WannaCry guy said, pay me in Bitcoin because that's anonymous and I don't want, you know, small amount of money, please. Some journalists managed to get to talk to some of the people behind this ransomware and they, were, and they said the, the bad guys were very disappointed because they made $85,000. They thought they were going to make a lot more. But it turns out that we weren't particularly up for being held to ransom. Okay. Think about what would happen <coughs> if I got users malware to get into your desktop machine. And then from that desktop machine I can get somewhere else, and then somewhere else, and somewhere else. I want you to understand this does nev this is not stopping. This is professional uh, hacking. People like us working together for their own purposes to get into your systems. This is nothing to ignore because it's lots of bad guys getting together to make as much money as they can and it's easy. Right, some more examples. Um, are you depressed yet? More. Who uses Java serialization? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, Mm, do you use any of these? Because it's a lot more than just Java serialization. Uh, fast Java, Red 5 IO AMF, don't know what that one is. Um, YAML files, JSON files. Did you know that in uh, there are vulnerabilities, deserialization vulnerabilities in JSON? You might think it's a data format only, but I actually know there are ways to use it to get serialization vulnerabilities and you've all heard about Java serialization vulnerabilities okay basically anywhere where you're persisting you're taking the graph of Java objects that you have in your system and you put it on disk or you recreate it right that's serialization and the, th the, the thing is is that people figure out how to exploit that now Java serialization the original full Java serialization uh, which I have to say, hands up, I was involved right at the beginning because I happened to be in Cupertino when they were putting in serialization. So I wasn't part of the design team, I was far too young, but I wrote some of the code um, and I had no idea it was a problem. This is what you have to do to get uh, into your system via Java serialization. What does that mean? So Java serialization attacks are where they try and figure out how to get down to runtime.exec from your Java objects. And because of the design of Java serialization, which allows me to craft payloads of arbitrary content, which your code will load up, okay, it's basically designed that way. If I can craft the right sequence of calls, I can eventually get down to runtime or exec. Okay. Uh, you can go read how to do that. There's some really nice cheat sheets about how to do this by here, you know, Java Dev. This is not hidden, this is very public because we have these guys called pen testers who are trying to <coughs> help us find our problems by checking our systems for vulnerabilities. But this is just an example of somebody explaining to you how you could do it. So the bad guys go, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, I've missed a page out. Oh, no, I haven't. Uh, okay, that's cool. Um, I have missed a slide, but it's on my deck, but it hasn't shown up. But let me go back. If you think that looks complicated, and even if you followed a cheat sheet to use that, you think it's still complicated, well, there is a tool out there which I was going to show you the page, but it doesn't want to show up. Um, that is called YO Serial, Yo Serial. It is a tool you can use and it knows about all the common exploits out there and it will build you the serialized form <coughs> to use the execute, to use that uh, attack. And it's public. Right, so more. Uh, JDWP, who uses a Java debugger? I thought, all oh, you Java guys, okay. Wow, some of you don't debug, hardcore, okay. <laughs> right. 
This is just a tale of woe. Some very large bank a long time ago left the debug port open on the internet. And some guy found it. In fact, it was a researcher, found the port, connected and went, look, I have access to the whole of your system. I can do whatever I want. I can change live data. I can do all this stuff. They paid him off, which is very good. Um, and then I think they eventually turned the port off. The, po the point is, it's sometimes it's just really simple things like that can expose your data. That one is a really trivial thing, but there are other places where your web application is sharing metadata that it shouldn't really do, like WebInf and um, server XMLs and all sorts of stuff and it can get uh, ex um, exposed inadvertently. You can't rely unless you check that your data is not being published, your config data is not being published. Okay. Ah, look, now it's coming back. This is really good. Okay, there's the tool I was talking about. Ah, I got it in the wrong place. That's why it wasn't coming up. That's the Serial tool. That's the list of uh, exploits that it can make use of, just like that. And no, I don't know why that gray silver thing is there. I can never get rid of it. More code, right. So, where have we got to? Uh, well, it's really bad, right? Because we don't pay attention. We write code, okay? And we try to be helpful, and a part of our helpfulness gets in the way. So let me give you some more. So look, some XML. Who here uses it, has to use XML? Yeah, okay, of course. So XML, okay, an account, name, address, balance, you know, all those things are like, okay. Somebody says, uh, can you write a converter to turn it to JSON? And you go, okay. And so you write some code. And it'll be JSON objects, and you'll probably go, well, my XML's got some structure, so I'll take the node type, you know, whatever it's address or um, account or bank balance or whatever, and I'll do some parsing. And you do that, and you go, yeah, I'm done. Okay? And then somebody says, oh, we're going to change the XML. We've added a new entry, which you can do with XML. Of course you can. Easy. Okay? So then you have to go back to your code, and you have to put another case statement in, and it goes on, and people come back and say, no, we put some more fields. You know what that's like. So you change your code. And you go, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to have a properties file which maps the XML element with a class that I can load and instantiate and do the work for me. Then I don't have to keep changing one particular piece of code. It's easy to test, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you write code like this, where you um, you try and take the name of the XML tag, and you look it up in the properties, you get the other name in the properties file, which is a class, and you turn it into a class object, and then you instantiate it. And then you say to it, go do your stuff. Okay, it's quite a classic design pattern. And then if things go wrong, you create a nice little error. Could not create class for handler, whatever the name of the tag was, and for class handler name. So I can tell you if it goes wrong, what was the name of the tag that I was parsing and what was the name of the class that I thought was going to be doing the work. Okay. This is quite, quite common. And by putting, sorry, let's go back because I didn't call it out. Over there on the properties file, I've backed it by system.get properties. Properties object, make a call on it, it's not in it, it will go to the next one down in the chain and quite often you'll get a properties object backed by system.get properties so that you can do things like dash d something, okay? That's great. And then when things go wrong, so if I try to run this, uh, I get a nice little error exception, could not create class for handler credit, class equals null. So that's a good example of um, you know, the missing handlers. I haven't put it in the properties file. Okay. Or then I have uh, could not create class for handler credit. Class equals com.foo.handler. Okay. That could be I've got I've configured okay, but I forgot, forgot to put the class in the class path. 
right? But it's being helpful. When things go wrong, I can see what the problem was. Okay. However, what happens if somebody gets into your system and gives you some XML that looks like this? Can you see the last line? java.ext.ders. What does your code do? Well, it throws it up because java.ext.ders is not a valid class. Well, it's not even java.ext.ders. It goes to Java. It goes to the properties file, and it looks for java.ext.ders, and of course, it's not there. And the properties file goes to the systems properties file, and it says, "Oh, I've got one," and it gives you the value. And then our code tries to turn it into a class, and we get a nice little error message that says, "Could not create class for handler java.ext.ders class equals." There's my extensions path. That simple thing has just that little help that I did by backing it on system.properties, which was nice for me to put dash D on, meant that anybody who can get into my system who can send me data, okay, imagine my data flow, give some XML, goes wrong, I'll give you a nice little error message. I've now given away secrets to my system. What's on the class path? Okay, what's my user address? What's my home directory? I've now got data that I can now use to come back into your system. Okay. So it's things like that. And the decoder error right at the beginning where you didn't quite get it right and it let you executed code you weren't supposed to. And delivery systems like WannaCry that get into your system all the time. Okay. So to my list, I can now add developer aids. So their bugs, their features, their developer aids where we're helpful. All of these things are things that can be exploited. And it isn't wrong to do these things. What's important to understand is that these things can happen. So that when you're doing your job, you're more conscious of the fact of the choices that you make. And at the end of the day, that's the biggest thing I'd like to take away. Now, I have slides here about how you can get hold of more information. CWE, there's all sorts of examples of how to write code better. This happens to be C and C plus, Java code. Some of this is really, some of this is really trivial, but it's still worth looking at. Uh, you can go to the seven pernicious kingdoms at CWE these are classifications of all the different types of error, error, poor coding practices that we have, like not validating our input, uh, getting APIs being used, a whole bunch of stuff. I could do hours on that as well, but I won't do. You can go read more about serialization and deserialization. This is the Oracle one. <sighs> it's very dry, but it will tell you what's going on. Or you can invite me back another time and I'll do my serialization fairy tale stories because I have some of those. Uh, there are tools to help you. These, they're all sorts. This is LGTM. You can point this at your GitHub. Uh, SNCC do thi similar things as well. Um, you want people to tell you that your code is not quite right, maybe a bit of a vulnerability. You want that help. Security tools to find bugs, same sort of things. Can I look at your code? Can I tell you that? Can I scan your dependencies to see that you're using something that's already got vulnerabilities in? You need these tools being part of your CI CD system to help you catch them. Remember the elephants? The biggest thing is to make sure that your system is kept up to date with vulnerabilities, vulnerability patches. Okay? And sure, you can learn how to write better software, and you should definitely do that. But right now, number one is the vulnerabilities piece. And here's how this the top OWASP is an, is an open organization that tries to give us some ideas of what are the top ways that people are getting into our systems, how are we being exploited, right? And you can go read about that. So I think that's it. You've got to reduce your risks. You've got to keep everything up to date. It is a horrible thing to say because we're not used to it, but we have to do that. You have to use all these scanning tools, okay? 
And there are things you shouldn't do. Don't write security managers. Don't write your own parsers. Don't write your own crypto tools. Hashing is not encryption, right? Yeah. Uh, you can go read about how to reduce serialization risks. Pierre's book um, article is really good, but again, it's serialization. So unfortunately, you can't get away from doing it. So you should learn as much as you can about how it can be exploited. The good news is, there's a little tiny bit of good news. Some of the things that we're doing right now are actually going to help us. So if you're learning about microservices, you're using microservices, then that compartmentalization helps. Because then if one service is compromised, it doesn't compromise the rest of them. Okay, so that's really good. And also because microservices need you to have a more robust CI CD system, there's better places for you to put in the night the right tools. But you need to do this stuff because if you do not start protecting your systems and thinking about how you scan for and fix vulnerabilities, you will get hacked. And I have another completely separate talk and I could talk to you about how easy it is to get hacked. And maybe while we're having the break, I'll show you just how easy it is to be discovered. Uh, that's it, I think. That was the last slide. Yes, thank you.